City University Television presents The American Theatre Wing Seminars Working in the Theatre This seminar Hello, I'm Sandra Gilman, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing, with our President, Doug Leeds. We welcome you to our Working in the Theatre Seminars. Each one of these programs covers a specific topic in the art of theatre. Today's seminar will focus on theatre and pop music. We'll be back during this program to tell you more about the work of the American Theatre Wing. But right now, Let's join our distinguished panel and our moderator, the former Artistic Director of Musical Theatre Works, Thomas Cott. Thank you, Sandra and Doug. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today's panel is presented in association with the New York Musical Theatre Festival. As many of you know, uh, the music of Broadway was popular music for the first half of the 20th century, and that all began to change in the mid-50s when Bill Haley uh, topped the charts with Rock Around the Clock, and of course Elvis Presley came along with a string of number one hits, including All Shook Up. And now All Shook Up is the title song of a Broadway musical, and pop songwriters like Elton John and Phil Collins are writing for the musical theater. So, we've gathered today to talk about pop music and Broadway. Are we in a new era for pop music on Broadway? And what makes pop songwriters want to write on Broadway to begin with? Uh, to answer these and many questions, we have an expert panel. And I'd like to introduce him to you now. On my far right, I have Stephen Bray, co-author of the new Broadway musical, The Color Purple. It's written for a variety of popular film and TV projects, as well as for various recording artists, including his own Grammy-nominated band, Breakfast Club, plus Gladys Knight, Kylie Minogue, and Madonna. Next to him, Lucy Simon, a two-time Grammy winner, began her career performing with sister Carly Simon. Her theater credits include A My Name is Alice and The Secret Garden, which received seven Tony nominations, including one for her score. And her latest show, Zhivago, premiered this summer at La Jolla Playhouse. David Yazbek wrote the crowd-pleasing scores to The Full Monty and the current hit Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. He won an Emmy for his work on Late Night with David Letterman and has written and or produced for such diverse artists as Tito Puente, Ruben Blades, Crash Test Dummies, and They Might Be Giants. On my left, Ali Willis, co-author of The Color Purple, an award-winning writer, director, designer, and interactive multimedia artist. A Grammy winner, uh, Ali has written songs that have topped the pop, R&B, jazz, country, and radio airplay charts, selling over 50 million records. And last but not least, Rupert Holmes, a double Tony winner for The Delightful Mystery of Edwin Drood. He has five new musicals in the works, yay. <laughs> Rupert also has distinguished himself for his work in movies, TV, and with recording artists including notably Barbara Streisand, and let us not forget his enduring number one smash hit, Escape, which you all know as the Pina Colada song. <laughs> Welcome to our panel. <coughs> so, let's begin by talking about the differences between pop music and theater music. And David, I want to start with you. And what is uh, different about the way you approach writing for the theater and writing for, say, your rock band? Well, the big difference is I'm acting when I'm writing for the theater. So I'm in a room finding what I have in common with the character that I'm writing for, and uh, that's sort of the first job for me. When I'm writing for myself, for, for an album, uh, it's, it's complete self-indulgence in a way. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's closer to sort of true art because it's needing to say something, wanting to say something, and, uh, and just saying it, you know. Not, not putting aside craft, but it's, it's about saying what I want to say and for theater, it's about helping the whole, the story, the character, and uh, getting them to say what I want them to say, <laughs> but what they want to say also. And, but in a, in a sort of pop musical style, though, so you're still being true to where you come from musically? Well, I, you know, I, I, I think one of the reasons why, as a, <coughs> as, a, as a rock musician, I'm kind of like sort of super marginal is that... Um, <laughs> is that I'm also extremely eclectic, and, I've, and I, I kept that aesthetic when I started writing for the theater and just said what, what's going to work is going to work for this scene or for this character. 
um, or for this moment. So, you know, my first show had rock elements in it. You know, there's a drum set, uh, and there were some songs that were kind of R&B songs, and there was a, there's a bossa nova in this, so in this show, or there's a lot of sort of uh, jazzy kind of stuff. So whatever, <coughs> whatever is called for that, that uh, I feel that I'm capable of doing and that will work, uh, st both in terms of l lyrics and especially in terms of music, that's what I'll do. Great. Um, Ali, you've obviously written in many different musical styles. Did you uh, have come up with the same issues when you were writing Color Purple? Uh, well, the same issues in that it had to be good <laughs> and it had to be, <clears throat> you know, adventurous getting over cold. Um, but um, I've, uh, for me personally, way more freedom writing for the theater, which I just adore. And I love having a visual and I love being able to tell a story and I love being able to take the, you know, the mindset of, of many different characters. And I'm, I'm someone who loves to kind of know the set of problems or challenges and then figure out a way to mush all that together and overcome all of it, whereas in pop music, and I adored my time there and got to work with unbelievable artists, but you're essentially having one thing to say, which, you know, you say in the chorus, and then you kind of build up, say it in the chorus, build up again, say it in the chorus, but you're essentially saying the same thing, and what I love about theater is that you, it's just constantly got to push along. And for us specifically, the challenges that we had were telling a story that <clears throat> a lot of people anticipate is going to be a very dark, gloomy, heavy story, when in fact it's a joyous, triumphant, at times really funny story. And how do you musically prepare the audience to be open, you know, to that, and then how do you take music from 1909 to 1949, not have it just sound like a review, you know, bring what we do into that. Um, so I, I just found the challenges of writing this to be beyond thrilling. And Stephen, uh, you're, the two of you are part of a three-person team working with Brenda Russell, who right. couldn't be with us today, but um, how does it work for the three of you to write together. It's unusual to have three composer lyricists working together. Three composer lyricists who don't read music. Um, or write. Or yeah, or, <laughs> or, or <laughs> notate either. Well, I, I refer to it as the Vulcan mind meld because we basically try to determine through talking what the agenda of a particular musical moment is or theatrical moment. And typically Brenda's at the piano more so, I would say, than, than either of the two of us. But in terms of generating a, a a sonic bed, but then I think then it becomes a, a threesome in terms of what the melody, what the phraseology of the melodies are, and and obviously what the lyric are because we're all doing com we're doing composing and, and uh, words at the same time really, and it just evolves organically. It will shift from music to lyric and back and forth and and all over the place. But it's t typically the three three of us have to enjoy it a lot for it to stand the test and. Or two people have to really, really like it. <laughs> so yeah. it's, dem it's democratic. It's, it's democratic, right? right? Majority no, rules. Yeah. yeah, we have a definite... Well, I mean, this has been as much and in the most fantastic way group therapy than anything. Because <laughs> we work as much at the collaboration as we work at the song itself. So as soon as two say, that's it, it's fantastic. The third, ha you have to let go. You're not allowed to bring it up again unless, <laughs> yeah. you know, a, a little later down the line, Although it still sucks. People try that. We, we <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's, it's a fa absolutely fantastic collaboration. It's the hardest room. I mean, I've worked with literally thousands of collaborators from, I don't know, you know, Bob Dylan to Stevie Wonder to whoever. This is the hardest room in the world. Interesting. It's, but it's fantastic because you have total confidence when you walk out. And, and you're collaborating with Marsha Norman on the book, and I know that, Lucy, you worked with her on Secret Garden. Yeah, we're all of the same family, I think, <laughs> <laughs> because Marsha is such a strong personality that, and, and in terms of writing for the theater, you know, you're not just writing yourself, as, as you say, you're writing other characters, but you're also translating the, the emotion of the book writer. 
uh, unless you write the book also, which Rupert does, I believe. And then you, have, then, then you don't need to worry about that. But, um, but there, there are so many things that come to play when you're writing a musical. It's, it's the, the personality of the character, of, the, of your collaborators, as you find. It's very interesting to work with more than m one collaborator. And I'm doing that with, with Zhivago. There are two lyricists, and me, and the, and the um, book writer, it's Michael Weller, and the director, who's Des Mackinoff. And you have to take all the personalities and put them sort of in, in, um, in an aura, and then you find what, what you want to say. It sort of sifts through you as the composer um, to, to put all of and these And how many of those people together. are in the room when you're doing that? Well, I usually write music by myself. There's something very personal to me about writing, and I get shy. You know, I, sort of, I don't want to expose what I, the, the, my process in front of people. I will, you know, I will hum a melody, or I will say, yes, this goes this way, or this should be rhythmic like that. But when I really put it together, I, I want to be alone. Um, it's, uh, it's a, the shower is great, as everybody's <laughs> discovered. I mean, there's, there's a reason for it. You feel completely safe and, and, you know, that no matter what you do, it's going to be all right. But I think in a good collaboration, you do have that feeling of safety. Mm -hmm. you, know, you trust each other. Well, we're noodlers. Right? Do you noodle and to find it, or do you hear it and then it comes out? Well, I, like you, I'm not, I'm not a trained musician, so I'm a singer. So I come from, um, my background is, you know, opera, leader, folk, rock, everything. <laughs> um, and, and so, uh, you know, the folk has guitar and, and classical music, more piano, but essentially I'm a vocalist. So I will approach something from a vocal point of view. And when I write for, for other characters, male characters, female characters, I write in their range so that I know what it feels like in their vocal cords, what, I, what it feels like in their bodies to sing that. Um, so, uh, but I'm not a lyricist, and I'm the only one of us that doesn't write lyrics. So m my concentration on melody, on the translation of the honesty of the moment, or the humor of the moment, or, or the personality, comes from a pure melodic form and not a verbal form. Mm -hmm. Rupert, as Lucy mentioned before, you have done it all. You wrote, I think you were the first and maybe the only person to win a Tony singly for both book and score. Yeah. Um, how does it feel like to collaborate with yourself, first of all, and now that you're working with so many other uh, uh, composers and lyricists on these other new projects, is it, that different for you? It, well, it, it's extremely different, and it keeps it very interesting for me. I actually uh, enjoy collaborating. People think simply because I, um, I, in the past, I've tended to write book, lyrics, music, um, that, that I prefer it that way. And there are times where it's, it, it's I'll tell you, it's wonderful for a producer and a director because if they, when there's one person writing it all, because if, if they decide something has to be changed, uh, it doesn't have to be sort of debated. If, if I go along with that, then <laughs> the next day everyone will have been right on, on board. So you don't argue with yourself? Uh, no, I don't argue with myself. <laughs> and I don't argue with my collaborators uh, either. Um, I'm, right now I'm, I'm writing with uh, uh, both people, I mean they're heroes of my Charles Strauss, Lee Adams, um, John Kander, uh, Alan and Marilyn Bergman, Michelle Legrand. And, um, and, and I interface in different ways being, I'm writing, doing a lot of book writing, which is interesting for me because um, I started out as a songwriter. Right. And uh, I wrote a, um, a script for um, uh, Bette Midler for a movie and uh, um, the, the head of uh, Disney said to me at the time, he said, now this is great now, who the hell do we get to write the music? And I thought, I've, I've done it, I've accomplished <laughs> it, I've made everyone forget I ever wrote a note. And, uh, I, I find that uh, it's, it's, I think that my having been a songwriter both for stage and, and in pop music uh, is helpful when I'm only writing the book because I have some sense of what the songwriting team is going through, what they're searching for. And I will very often, I found what's been working very effectively is that I will write a scene and give it to my collaborators and say, now, this is what a song might cover. This is the terrain that it might cover. And no one will ever see this but you. Uh, but it would be great if this could now be a song. Um, and, and sometimes some of the dialogue ends up in the lyric, uh, which is uh, both flattering and uh, uh, maddening. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it, it's just, it does keep those, um, those big council of wars that, that go on um, 
uh, councils of war that go on uh, to a minimum when you're writing it all alone. Uh, the director comes to you and says, hey, could we just, would there be a way? And instead of five people having five ideas, um, you come up with the one you think is best. It's, in The Mystery of Edwin Drood, we were able to make changes literally overnight. And I was the orchestrator on that as well. Hmm. So by the time the morning came around, uh, a change could be effected in, in 12 hours, and, except for the part about me sleeping. <laughs> Now, we've gotten a little bit lost in our uh, yeah. discussion about pop music, and I'm curious, uh, maybe you want to start, um, Ali, about, uh, I mean, obviously, you've written in many different musical styles, but theater music is a very particular thing, and were you, did you have any trepidation about the craft of that, or? Well, I didn't grow up being for me. He's laughing already. I'm laughing no, because no. that word I'm is not in her. her. Trepidation's not in her. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm definitely, like, I don't like to... Uh, um, I'm as spontaneous as could possibly be. So um, the fact that this was completely new to me, at the same time as being terrifying and horrifying, was also so uh, exciting because I tend to be at my best when I kind of don't know rules. But what I certainly realized was you ha not having come up understanding musical theater or seeing a lot of it, that it would be impossible to write anything not knowing why people loved theater. And that I would have to get to that point before I could even write a note. And we spent probably the first year of getting the gig I actually got involved with the project in 1999, but we officially got it in two and then began writing in 2001. But we spent the first year um, reading every book, you know, how to write a Broadway musical through, you know, whatever, um, listening to soundtracks and... Cast albums, please. Cast albums. Ca cast, albums. <laughs> cast albums. I still don't know the, the, the terms. Um, Going to see but, a lot of shows. We yeah, to of but shows. you know, in my case, because we, you know we were in LA, so I saw like high school productions. <laughs> and, you know, what, however I could I could do it, and I started getting fascinated with certain writers, and really seeing like you know how when you write for the theater, how I mean Stephen Sondheim becoming like fanatic about him, but reading about him books and books and books before I actually started listening to everything, which was an incredible way to start you know coming into it. But, um, uh, you know, it got to the point where I thought, I don't ever want to write pop music again. I mean, I just love this so, so, so much. Um, but there, I, I think that we bring a lot of our sensibility from pop music. Like, I think, um, you know, in pop music, you have to get to the hook. Like, if you're going to write a song and not get to the hook for three minutes, no one's, you know, no one's ever going to hear that song. So learning about the theater, which one of those rules can be broken? which one of those rules can't be broken. Um, and then really trying to something, write something that honors the theater, but that doesn't leave us out of the mix, because why were we you know, brought into it in the first I, place? I think one thing about the hook that you mentioned, um, you know, pop music, as you said in your introduction, used to be, a lot of it used to come out of the theater. <clears throat> I, I really think that in a lot of musical theater music, uh, there are a lot of composers who've sort of forgotten the concept of the hook. Not that you need it in your brain, just, it, it's just, it's very, very nice <laughs> to have some element of a song that, in the theater, that's a hook. And uh, I, just, I just know that when, I, when, when they hired me to do Full Monty out of nowhere, um, I asked the director, why, you know, why, why me? And he heard some of my albums and he said, because I think you know where the hook is. And I, and I thought, oh, I'd like to work with him because I like things to be catchy. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be the whole show, doesn't have to be catchy. And there's certainly stuff that's through composed that, that isn't structured, you know, with the hook in mind that's very effective. But even a show like Light in the Piazza, which is, uh, you know, very, it's very lyrical, it goes places, it's not structured in a way that you expect, you know that guy who happens to be a friend of mine, but... Um, <laughs> Adam Gettle, we can say Adam, Adam Gettle. Adam Gettle, you know that he knows where the hook is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I treasure that when I'm 
Hooks kind of make show. audiences comfortable as as well. Whether it's a radio audience, whether it's a theater audience. Explain what you mean by hook, just in case people. Um, know uh, a part of a song that is uh, very hummable that might come around a couple of times, but that there's something familiar enough about it so that you can settle into it, and hopefully something that's innovative enough about it so that you just you must hear that again, and again. The thing about hooks. Um, on radio or on TV as opposed to theater is that you have to remember that when you're creating a, a, a musical you get control of the environment for maybe two hours. You know the thing about writing for pop music um, is that uh, you have to, the, the world that you're writing for is already predetermined. It's called today, it's called now. And generally speaking you have to write in the vernacular and, and you don't have control of how many times your song will be played in the next half hour. Uh, it would be, uh, unless you pay the right people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, but when you write a musical, the joy of it, and, and I, I have to believe that for all of us who have written pop and then go to, to write for theater, um, it's, it's uh, kind of an, this exultant, uh, liberating feeling. Uh, even though you have a whole new list of constraints and, 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 and worries, um, the thing is that you're no longer writing for today necessarily, and I don't mean for the audience of today. I mean the world you're writing for need not be I don't want to state the date because I know these things get replayed, <laughs> but uh, uh, you're writing for a world that you invent and then you create the music and have the people speak with the words that seem appropriate to both that world and their character. It's not just their personality. Uh, in Mystery of Edwin Drood, I, I, I can't write as a pop songwriter. I'm no longer allowed to write I'm wild again, beguiled again, a whimpering, simpering child again. I'm just not allowed to do that because that's not real. Um, but uh, Mystery of Edwin Drood, I can do hey, pity, one, pity, tuppity, thrubbity, twelve, do a shilling, twice that to a florin, and would you not fit? I can write things like that, and that's what those characters should do. But it's this idea that when you, you, when you write for theater, if you have something in a song that's important to you, whether it's the phrase, the light, and the piazza that you're going to bring back towards the end, um, you know, you know, I'm going to play this song in another 15 minutes when uh, the audience is going to, because in pop music, familiarity breeds content. Uh, the, the, no one's given a name to this fact that when we hear things several times, we start to like them more. Well, in, in the old school of musicals, you would have multiple repri reprises yeah. of songs, so yeah. that by the time you left the theater, you were humming it. Yeah. And, so even, we, and even before you entered the theater, you'd already heard it mm -hmm. on the hit parade well, and over and over again. That's my, that's my, <laughs> my father's constantly says, well, I used to come out of a show, I could hum every song, and I'd say, Dad, you already heard every song. You heard it on <laughs> the Ed Sullivan show, you heard right, it. Right. And uh, I get, was it Cy Coleman who said they don't, they don't go out whistling the tunes, they used to come in whistling the tunes. Yeah, well, th that's, that's maybe the biggest factor for the drought, for this gap between, I, I think, between pop music and theater. Pop music was where, theater was the source of a, a majority of the pop music we were listening to. And I can remember right up until, as, as a kid, I would listen to Billy Taylor on WNEWAM. And he, every time a Broadway show opened, right up through maybe 62, 63, you would think, I wonder what the song is from this show. What's, what's going to be the song that people play? And I mean, uh, so that Do, Re, Mi makes someone happy. Now, no one remembers the show Do, Re, Mi unless it's revived at Encores, but you had the song Make Someone Happy, and it would be sung on Ed Sullivan, it would be done on the hip. The, the death of the variety show on TV really killed that crossover, because once you started getting AM radio, top 40 radio, not playing the kind of material that they're not playing on the street where you live, which Vic Damone had a kind of a hit with, and so when you went to see it, you knew on the street where you live. Uh, once variety shows went away, and Broadway was no longer a source for things to be performed in other mediums. Uh, people walked in and they'd say, gee, they don't write those songs like they used to. And, that, and, and what you told your dad was, was what used to madden me when people said that. You know, they, they're not writing those scores. Yeah, but when you went to see a show, when I went to see My Fair Lady, I knew every song in that score. And I wasn't necessarily that much of a theater maven. It wasn't that I. Knew but those I were hook filled songs. They were wonderful songs. I mean, songs, th yes. those great musicals to me of the 50s and 60s were totally hook filled yeah. songs. And in coming up through pop music, that's kind of where I lost track of musicals after that. Well, you do have some examples, like uh, Gwen Stefani did a song, Rich Girl, Rich recently, Man, yeah. which was sampling a bit of the melody from right. Fiddler on the Roof. 
Um, so there are some, some periodic examples of, you know... Hard Knock Life was used in the rap well, As we're movie. writing musicals and we're writing the songs, I think we all feel is there's something that could be a takeout song, that is that it's is a song that somebody else could record and it could be played on the mm-hmm. radio. And, and w- when you start thinking that way, you sort of get yourself into trouble because the main thing that you have to do in writing for the theater is write something that is absolutely true to the moment. And there are very few times I find that, that we can say, yes, this is something that Barbara Streisand should sing or, or one of the, the younger people that covers other, other I'd be songs. Happy to write a, I'd be happy to write a takeout song if I thought anyone was going to, if there was any medium to take it out, just, just for the sake of the show. You know, I, 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 you hear about Sondheim not wanting to write Send in the Clowns. He just didn't want to do it. And then he did it, and... Uh, it was that was a that was a but nice was, moment in the show and that a great was a stra- song. that was strange as a takeout song. I mean that really is not a normal um, a normal takeout song. It's a brilliant song, but the fact that that you know Judy Collins had the perfect voice and and the the you know was it uh, Arif Martin was ready to do something that was really risky. But again, Jonathan, he wrote it for a character. He wrote it and, he wrote it for, and, and for an actress who had very limited yes, breath. So that's right. he had to write short phrases, and that became why. But he wrote I think it. it was freaky that it became a hit. I don't think he did it with the right. intention of uh, this is going to be something that everybody's going to know, and it's going to be a, a hit song. I don't think I don't think you can write that You'd way. You'd be if crazy it to do it because there's there's so little your chances, even yeah, if it's a great great right. song. So, but and well, because there's also there's also like a. a uh, there's also a um, imposed upon musical theater music, and part of partially it's deserved is the feeling that it's uh, that it's corny, and uh, you know it just has to do with you know pop music has a lot to do with fashion and changes constantly, and it seems to that fashion seems to change faster and faster right. every every year. But um, you know I I just know from experience that there's this big Chinese wall between, and I grew up listening to all kinds of musical theater, opera, and jazz, and you know, all kinds of different genres, and, uh, and I still do. And, um, but people like to categorize, compartmentalize, compartmentalize and, and it's very hard to, to get through, even if it's, a, if it's a great song. You know, you'd have to really have a lot of pushing going on uh, to One, cross it. I'm sorry. I think the divergence that, that Richard mentioned in 1962, though, has to do with the difference in ages between the people that listen to, if we're calling popular music that, which is on the radio a lot, the, 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 the audiences for those radio stations are much younger than the audiences that are going to the theater, as far from what I can see. And well, I think it varies from show to show. I, mean, I think it's possible, though. I, 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 but I think it's, to go into it, say I'm going to write a radio hit, that's, like, foolish. Right. But I think if... I think the character has to have, the, what, whoever you're writing for, has to have a, a struggle or a triumph that, would, that someone listening to the radio could associate with. Is there a breakout hit from Color Purple? Um, who knows, but I certainly hope so, but I would never say, you know, yes. But um, I, I hope so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but I think that that's it, that sometimes what the subject of musical theater is and the piece that you're writing for doesn't lend for that identification. Um, and I know me with my pop songs, I always, um, I never would really write for the day. I mean, my, my theory there was you want to write something that then defines the next day that then everyone's going to copy for the next couple of years. So I always tried to be more on the outrageous end of that <laughs> anyway. Um, and I think it's possible, but I think the circumstances of the piece that you're writing for really need to Dictate, yeah. I have a question that. about uh, the personality that comes through when there are three writers, obviously with very different personalities. Um, do you do you find that you that you have a collective personality on this, or it, can you say you recognize Absolutely. your music? Oh, you yeah. recognize. Yeah, any of us l- any of us left to our own devices would complete so, com- com- totally create something different. completely other really. than what we have. But yet there are things like I know that. In the end, there are certain places where he is king that 
if I'm like not sure about it and he says, like I think, which is not how I went into this thinking, but I think lyrically he's brilliant. Um, I think he's a brilliant st strategist for how things should develop. Um, I think, you know, my thing is you know, if something goes, you know, like totally <laughs> takes a left turn, you know, melodically or starts like, you know, reaching places, I think that's my thing. And in lyrics, a certain thing. I think Brenda's, Brenda's also the best player among us. Um, quarterly is great. So we have different areas where right. you kind of know someone's in there. And you, you can identify the elements of a particular person's influence, but, uh -huh. but, but like I, I really think that if, if um, like Ali says, if, if the melody's doing something unexpected and, 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 and especially interesting, I'm sure Ali was the reason behind that, because <laughs> I like the cozy expe expected turns and and Allie goes no because everyone knows it's going to happen so why not go somewhere but else? what is great and then we also have a thing like Steven's a drummer and uh, very precise and very like you know on grid I am and I think this is from my earth wind and fire <laughs> days you know way like groove behind like just you know the pocket where wherever it is and I'm constantly saying yes but Allie we have to write it down on paper <laughs> <laughs> someone has to be able to do this again and but again but between the two between the absolute mathematic precision and the uh, just you know how does it feel there is this unbelievable blend that would never Happens. That's so exciting. Yeah. I tell you, this is the show that I just cannot wait to see. I'm just so excited about it. It sounds so innovative and powerful, and I, I'm thrilled about it. Thank you. Thank you. Talking to Marsha, I'm just getting such wonderful feedback. Lucy, what you said, though, really intrigues me, because you said you're working with two lyricists yeah. on this. And are you talking about two lyricists writing the same... Uh, the lyric to one Working song? Working on the same song. Oh, okay. And it's very strange. I mean, I, I'm not sure it's Have it's they the collaborated idea. together never, before? Never, never. And I started with one, with Michael Corey, who's a wonderful okay. lib opera librettist, mainly, and because I have this huge project, which is Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago, it need, we need to take it seriously. I mean, <laughs> uh, this is not the, the, at least when we first started, it didn't feel like this was going to be a, a pop, score. It felt it was going to be a more serious operatic, although my style tends not to be, tends, I don't know, I write in my own style. That's why I asked about the personality. It always sounds sort of like me, but it, with a very different mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what, <laughs> structure or, or, or feel. But anyway, so we started with Michael Corey, who wrote wonderfully, but when we got to the, when I got to the things that I felt needed the hook, and the hook is, for those who don't know that, that term, it's when a song lands, when you feel you're coming back, you're coming home to it. And it also you know, tells you something about what the characters are experiencing. But it's that, that sense of somebody really knowing the craft of how to get to that hook. And Michael really just didn't have any, any idea about that. So I brought in um, uh, Amy Powers, who is a pop lyricist, and so completely different from Michael. And seeing the two of them together working on something is hysterical because they are very different, but they really complement each other. So, you know, I don't know if it's an ideal thing to, to have two people on lyrics. Um, it might be better to have two people <coughs> composing because you do get the, the strong rhythmic thing and the funny thing and the, you know, you, well, you get them well all. It worked well for and Green, so. Yes, it did. <laughs> Alan Absolutely. and Alan Bergman are, are a unit yeah. of, of that rarity and, but, of, and a, they of a form, duo. They, they have now the same voice, you yeah. know, and that's why I asked it, do you, do you find that you have the same voice in, in this writing? I'd like to ask the folks that have done this before, because Ali and I are new to this, this genre. In terms of, like what you're saying, Prasternak, pop, uh, repeatable choruses are what a lot of people consider to be a very strong element of a hook. And are you, do any of you do that? Are, is the chorus the same lyric? Because usually a character needs to have moved somewhere. It usually doesn't. Yeah. It, it's the same musical hook. Right. But the, the lyric usually will, will advance. Which is difficult in, in terms of creating something that's going to be taken out into that's the right. world because people are not used to that. I really, world. you know, it's funny, but uh, I mean, a number of I've seen this written a number of times about the mystery of Edwin Drood. I think I was so thrilled to be writing for theater, which I'd always wanted to do, that I actually really did never 
say to myself, what's the song I'm going to write that's going to be covered? Uh, I mean, there's a song, Moonfall, that Renee Fleming and Streisand and Judy Collins have recorded, but, but that was, that's, more of, that's nice that those recordings are there. It, it's not a pop hit record. Um, get it in auditions all the time. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. so beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's, it, that's a, a lovely thing for it to have that life. Um, but I really was so in love with being in this forest of this you, uh, of 1895, not literally, but just in this in this in this realm that I almost enjoyed not having that concern. Mm -hmm. I think it would, I, I probably think about it a little bit more now when we're working on musicals. But again, it, it, it's also you know this the, the, the issue of of because um, it, it used to frustrate me when people would say, "Well, you're a pop songwriter." Do, do you, Joe Papp said to me originally, he said, who's going to write the book of this thing? And I said, well, I, I, I thought I would do that. And he said, well, how can you do that? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm a story songwriter. Almost everything that I've written is a story song. I said, I've had to write stories in three minutes with a fade ending, and they rhymed. So the idea, <laughs> and the idea of writing, uh, saying the word love, and not knowing that in two lines I'm going to have to say push comes to shove, or Wings of a Snow White Dove. It's my theory that the peace movement was very assisted by the fact that dove and love rhymed. Um, or Dangle a Participle with You Are the Woman I Am Thinking Of. Um, it, it, I suddenly said, well, that's great. I don't have to say the same thing the second chorus because the character has learned something in right. the process of singing this. So I sort of in, enjoyed that. I don't think uh, every producer would want everyone to think that. I, I actually tried the experiment of writing a pop record for the show when the show went to London. We had Lulu, who had had a hit with To Sir With Love, taking over the Cleo Lane role. And uh, she was still a pop recording artist. And I thought, there's a song I want to rewrite anyway. Let me write the pop version of it first, and then age it. Uh, write it as a pop tune, mm -hmm. and then see if I can rewrite the lyrics so it fits the Victorian mm -hmm. setting, and uh, rearrange it so it sounds like it's in the show. And I, I tried it, and I... Uh, didn't, didn't like work. it, didn't like, didn't like it, no, struck the song. But was your back. agenda to make the lyric, lyric repeatable in the chorus? Absolutely. Or? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I set out to do that just to see if that could be done. And you know what? It worked as in the pop record, but it ceased to work in the show. Yeah, it gets yeah. So I, boring. I mean, you're of, yeah. watching it and yeah. you're like, uh, you just can't pound it in, pound it in, pound yeah. it in. Yeah. Yeah, I, but, I but learned in, that lesson the hard way, too. <laughs> <laughs> but in the shows, that, the shows you're referring to where pop and, you know, where they're synonymous, the, there was, you know, there, maybe there was a sort of button hook type of situation where on the street where you live, somebody mentioned, I think, or, where you keep coming back to a phrase or something. So I, I just think that... Well, usually in the hook, you'll, you'll come back to one phrase that's, that's the same, you know, that... The title. That, the title of the song, mm -hmm. and then, then you'll take it from a different... Type but a hook, can be, a, a hook can be a groove, a drum beat, a phrase. I mean, you know, a hook is the thing that that hooks your ear, and there can be more than one hook in, in, a, yeah. in a song. Hopefully Absolutely. there are. Yeah. Um, but when you're sitting in the audience seeing Evita for the first time, and she goes, I give my promise, and the French horn comes in, da, 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 don't keep your distance, you sit there and you think, oh, that's a very nice thing that just yeah. happened. I yeah. do hope that will I happen hope that again. Happens again. Right. And, then and it does. luckily it, it happened does, 17 right. more times. <laughs> <laughs> And you're like, Weber's no fool. <laughs> I was just singing that love also rhymes with Tish above, but there wasn't any big Hasidic. <laughs> it's a very good point, and I'm developing a musical along those lines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stephen, I'm curious um, how you came to work in the musical theater, and what made you think this is something you wanted to do? I came on with Allie's Train. Allie was uh, friends with our producer, who was, I think, maybe looking for some other writers. <laughs> yeah, no, there were two, it went on almost two years where the, he called me first in 1999 and said I just got the right to do the Color Purple as a musical. And I do a lot of other things besides music, but really wanted to get back to songwriting. So I thought, this is it. He's going to ask me to do the Color Purple. It's fantastic. And he instead, said, get out your Rolodex. Yeah. <laughs> instead, Talk he said, I'm going to give you names of two writers, both of whom were wildly inappropriate for this. But, you know, recommend one, and I gave him my honest feelings about both, and then for a year would hear, you know, details about these, you know, how the project was coming, and it was killing me, because I thought, <laughs> I'm like, this is, should be mine, you know. In Did his you defense, ever say, 
I, ne I didn't no, Isn't I didn't that funny? say a word. We're all so reticent to say this is No, and in his defense, this, right? Scott Sanders, yeah. the producer, he knew me more through an art phase and a technology phase right. than a musical phase. And in fact, I met him when I, I and which I met when I met Stephen because I art directed uh, his band had a hit in this I think was a the long 80s, time ago. Late, yeah, <laughs> late 80s. And I was art directing the video. So I met Stephen and I met Scott Sanders on the same day. So I think he thought of me as more of an art person. The hits I had during my run with him were whiter than I usually wrote. But like he knew me through like the theme for Friends and a lot of like Pet Shop Boys and Culture Club. When in fact my roots were really like Earth, Wind and Fire, Pointer Sisters, stuff that we would would have made me more appropriate for this. But um, anyway, then he called me up a year later and he said, okay, we need to discuss, you know, writing again. I thought, this is it. And this time he bounced the name of 50 songwriters off of me. <laughs> and he got to the name Brenda Russell. And uh, I had co-created two animated series and was writing half of them, the scoring half of them was Stephen and half of them with Brenda. And I thought, like, if I don't jump in, I'll never do it. And, you know, said to him, what if I write something with Brenda? Because at this point he wanted everyone to write a spec song that, who was going to compete to get this gig. And, you know, Stephen Bray, what if the three of us go in? And he says, that's fine, but no special favors. And it's like, no <laughs> special favors? You never even thought of me, you know. <laughs> and um, so the only advantage we had was that I had actually picked who we were competing against. <laughs> Check the but they really were the best. They were like, there were some phenomenal pop writers in there. And he w did not want a pop musical. He just wanted a fresh That's spin. Yeah. So we spent two and a half months writing this spec song. One song. Is that in the show? Yes. It really became kind of the cornerstone that the uh -huh. whole show. It's completely it's, different now, though. It's completely yeah. different, but the hook remains. And what is it called? <laughs> Sugar Avery coming to town. Oh, yeah. So. I remember hearing about but they, it. But they completely changed from then, because I'm sure they, they called us because they wanted pop. But now, you know, ever since we started putting things on, 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 it, on their feet, it's, you know, the agenda's changed because, as David said, it's pretty boring if you're, saying this, if you're saying the same thing two minutes in and two and a half minutes in, and it's, yeah. it doesn't work. And you can't resort to any, uh, you know, pop music is sort of a recorded music. Right. And you just can't resort to, really, m most of the time successfully, to any recording studio tricks in terms of building Definitely. a song. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's very interesting because I've worked, uh, I've sort of helped out with, you know, after the fact with certain shows that um, that did manage to really get a produced album like sound hmm. into the theater and i and i I suspect there was a lot of looping just a lot of tracks going on because it was just too well controlled, but I was sort of thinking, boy, I wish I could <laughs> I wish I could get a sound like that because then you could use certain tricks that you might use in the studio but they don't help you dramatically right no they, they don't, don't but yeah. they but you know sometimes sometimes you just you know, the bigger your palette is, your toolbox is, the better it is. Right, but right. there's all kinds of stuff. You were, you were talking about the pocket. And I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, I, there's, there's a drummer. He's the drummer in my band. I hired him for uh, Full Monty. I hired him for this show. And he's a great drummer. He can do anything. And I just love his pocket. Mm. And when he's not there, mm -hmm. the whole show's Changes. different for yeah. me. Yeah. And it's just one of the Very things that's a killer yeah. is that with, with the theater, it's... Everything's always changing. The actors, certain people in the in the pit. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't have that control. And for me, that was one of the hardest things about s starting with the Fulmati, starting in the theater, was um, going from a, a, a studio play setting where I could control everything. And if I didn't like it, I could do it again. To this to this place where you're you're abdicating a lot of control to very talented people on a nightly basis. Um, and now, now I can deal with it, but <laughs> it, it, that's Chase Mishkin laughing because she's seen me dealing with it. But uh, it's a big difference. Another, another thing that's different about pop music and Broadway is that in the theater, of course, we have intermission. So I need to take a pause here. Uh, we'll be right back. And these are a few words about the American Theater Wing. The American Theater Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence, and we support education in the theater. Best known for creating the Tony Award, 
Our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequaled forum for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theatre Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Now, let's return to the seminar. I want to talk about um, different musical styles uh, that are used in the theatre, and I'm wondering if you think that there is a place for contemporary styles like rap or hip-hop or anything like that in musical theater. Can, Stephen? Why are you looking at me? Well, because you've, you've worked in, <laughs> I'm, I'm in, uh, <laughs> in many different, uh, in different, <laughs> I look at you because you, you have worked with many different uh, singers of, of that genre, so I'm curious if you think you could ever write a show in uh, those styles. I would like to. I, I think it's no more um, unlikely than, you know, the rock underpinnings of Wicked. For instance, I, I don't see why it, there couldn't be, um, you know, a hip-hop oriented score. But I think you, you just wind up with the same issues in terms of an actable lyric, for instance, and, and you know, the, the repeatable choruses. As long as people are willing, I think, I think audiences would be very willing to and excited by a very contemporary sounding score. And I think you've come into some of the issues David brought up in terms of how do you recre recreate some of the contemporary sounds night after night because, you know, we're using samplers to create those very artificial drum sounds and whatnot and there's probably ways around that but I, I think the bigger issues are going to be do your uh, as Rupert was saying how do your actors can you can you find a story that it, it works in a, in a setting you know if it's not about hip hop culture can it use that context you know and still work and I think the other issue and a really big issue is you don't just want an evening of 20 hip-hop songs. So, and I think this is about really any style that comes into writing for theater, but especially something like that or a more contemporary one, because then you just have a review. And so how do you take, you know, the, the heartbeat of, of hip-hop and the funk of hip-hop, and how do you blend that with more theatrical music and then I think you end up with this unbelievable mutant form that would interest people and hook people into it but just to put 20 hip-hop songs in or just to put 20 rock songs in or whatever it is um, it will only appeal I think to that audience it won't certainly won't endear a theatrical you have another audience. you have another very practical obstacle to also because I think artistically you could ac actually have a show with 20 hip-hop songs if they were I mean hip-hop is is incredibly varied genre you know or with 20 rock songs I think you're gonna have half uh, at least half of the audience who can afford to pay a hundred dollars on Broadway doing this because it's allowed it's a you know a good rock and good good funk and good hip-hop is loud it's gotta be loud it drives me crazy when there's a song that should be loud and it can't be loud because of the um, the sound system in the theater or whatever, but you don't, you, you know, there's an audience there. They're paying a lot of money. If there was a way to get the, the, the price level down so that younger people or um, people... There are a lot of concerts today, pop concerts. $100? Not $100, but they're expensive. They're expensive, but, you know, it's, it's, it, it's not the only way you can go, it's not the only way you can hear that music. Right. I mean, you can buy... Again, it just has to do with a lot, a lot with the way Broadway is perceived. You know, the guys in my band now call me Broadway's David Yazbek. <laughs> they don't say it as like a compliment. You know. <laughs> they, they say it. They say it to get my goat. You know. Um, Wicked was pretty loud, though, don't you think? So, Wicked was. Well, what's the loudest show out there? Well, right I'm now? not saying. I mean, well, loud, what right? I'm really what I'm saying is there's just there's also this thing with, about you've got an audience. You've got an audience who comes to see shows for a particular reason, and they're, they're very well me, maybe a way, it's just a conversation that happens all the time, a way of, of bringing different people into the audience, people who are afraid of Broadway. I'm not sure what it is. 
but there might be a way. I remember as a kid going to see the Philharmonic, looking around me and seeing a lot of people who were asleep and well-dressed and thinking, <laughs> and thinking this, is, this is great music, you're, and you're just asleep and well-dressed, and you're there for reasons other than for the music. And, you know, I'm not saying the Broadway audience isn't there for the show and for the music, but you, you know how it just things get ossified. And uh, if someone can figure out a way, and I think dropping ticket prices somehow is, has something to do with it, um, to, to, uh, to open things up to a, to a new audience, that would be great. Uh, so well, that's if you're out there. <laughs> certainly worth pursuing, but a different well, conversation than we probably can have time to talk about today. Um, I, I'm, I guess we should talk a little bit about uh, though the, the differences between music business and the theater business, and um, are they different? And is it? I mean, for example, Rupert, when you when we're having the number one hit song with Escape, I mean, it's still a, a popular song. It's in Shrek. It's in American Splendor. It's in Bewitched. It's in lots of movies now. It's it's still playing 25 years later. Yeah. Is the music business different now? Is it? Uh, well, the music. I was fortunate when I got in the record business, uh, I, I, it, I, I got to see the last remnants of the era when um, one person could run a record company. And the artists were signed by, say, Florence Greenberg on Scepter Records, who just, she'd say, I like him and I like her, and that's who, and she'd say, we're going to promote this. Uh, that went away as, as record companies became uh, <coughs> corporate entities and as they each swallowed the other up until we now have, we'll soon have, you know, like two record labels and with little, lots of subdivisions, but it's all, um, almost everything that I've ever recorded, they, they put out a five CD set of everything I ever recorded recently with Universal Music, and they can do that now because they own all the different <laughs> record labels mm. that I recorded for. Um, so the record business itself changed during the time that I was there, and then very important to us in theater, I think, is that, um, and for myself as a story songwriter, a change took place with the advent of the music video. Because up until then, uh, songwriting still was a remnant of, uh, could be a rem uh, uh, the last surviving uh, remnant of the golden age of radio, where you would listen to a story over the radio and you would supply the images. And the images that you came up with were different from what you're, the person sitting next to you was coming up with. And so you were the cinematographer uh, for songs. And then music videos came. There's nothing good or bad, it's just this is what happened. And every song that was a single came with a video attached. So if I hear Material Girl, I'm going to envision Madonna doing the, the takeoff of uh, Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. If I hear Sledgehammer, it's, I'm going to see that Peter Gabriel video in my mind. That took a lot of that storytelling ability away from, one, away from the listener, and it also took some of the burden of telling a story within a song away from uh, some songwriters, because they started finding that they were writing underscore for a great movie. Uh, a terrific underscore, nothing wrong with it. These are great songs, but the, the burden of the song was no longer to tell a story. If you were telling a story in the director decided he was going to tell a different story, you'd have two stories competing with each other. So it almost became a problem when, when there was a story, unless you were prepared to film the specific story of that song. So the music business has changed, the record business has changed both in terms of the fact that it's a very, very corporate thing. It's not doing very well, by the way. Um, and also artistically, sort of, I think some of the demands of it changed. Um, whereas in theater, you still can have, as I saw in the record business, people who sit there, basically a producer, who says, I I'm doing the show, I'm going to make the show happen, and fights for show for five years, eight years. Who fights for a recording artist for eight years? You get two singles, maybe, if you're lucky. So in a way, it's, it's almost still, you know, we're getting that in theater now, too, because it's so expensive to put on a show. So big corporations are coming in, and theaters that I always knew as the, you know, having a, a name now are called the United Airlines movie, uh, Broadway American Theater. Airlines, yes. No, no, I was, I was trying to avoid saying the oh, real sorry, one. But... I was saying one that was in receivership. <laughs> but, uh, uh, <laughs> cha chapter 11 now is, means several different things for storytelling. Uh, but mm. but uh, so, so I, I do think that we do have in theater still, though, individuals who try to 
shape a project. Uh, what, and not just the people who create it, but the people who produce it as well. In that way, it reminds me of the old record business, not the new. You mentioned about five or even ten years to make a show happen. You talked about Color Purple, you first heard about it in 1999. Nine. And you have been working on I've been schedules for... That took two years. Oh, really? That's unusual. Well, it, it, I was, it's related to what, what uh, Rupert was saying about um, the, the, the dome of protection you have when there's an individual or some kind of entity that's really protecting the, the process of the show. And in my case, I was lucky because in the first show I did, uh, Jack O'Brien, who was also the artistic director of the Old Globe Theater in San Diego, which is a great theater to do anything at, um, he just, you know, sort of s spread his arms and there was no, there, were, there was no hierarchy I want to use, <laughs> use the word I always use, but I can't. There's no hierarchy of meddlesome uh, people who don't know what they're doing ab uh, above him. And, and uh, I, I've experienced it in the record business, but especially I've experienced it on television as a writer, as a TV writer. There's always three or four people whose job it is to try to figure out what they can say in a meeting that'll, that'll remind the other people in the meeting that they exist. Yeah. And it's always negative, because it's easy to say, say something negative. Um, as the critics, uh, certain critics, you know, have, fa have found in the, it, the <laughs> critics, <laughs> I hate them. Uh, but, 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 but my point is, my point is in the theater, what I loved about it, just loved about it, was the idea that you could play. I mean, you could do what you needed to do. And, you know, if something didn't work, you, you kind of all knew it. And you could throw it away. You could go with your instincts um, and, uh, I had, not, I had never experienced that before as a writer or, uh, or when, I was, when I had a, a major label deal. So um, it's great. Now it's true. There's so much money involved now. Yeah, it's, it's that going, it, that's changing. It, it is changing. When I, 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 Joe Papp, I was in Joe Papp's office. He had encouraged me to write a musical. And he took the phone off the hook. And for three hours, I stood in his office and I performed the mystery of Edwin Drood from start to finish. He voted on the endings and all like that. <laughs> and I thought after all this work I put into this, it was about three years of work because I'd done it all alone, um, I thought I, I'm going to, uh, I feel I, I have the right to demand a, a, a reading. Uh, and uh, I finished and he said, okay, well, every summer we do Shakespeare in the Park, so this year you'll be Shakespeare. And if it goes well, we'll go to Broadway. And I said, no, I demand a reading. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> And, and, but one person could do that right. and, and just hit a button and, it all, and suddenly things are being built and costumes are being well, made. Well, you're talking both about nonprofit theaters where there are one or two people in charge as opposed to the commercial theater where there tend to be committees of people involved. Well, but in both but it my, did go, I'm sorry, go. I was going to say in both my shows there was, a, there was a, in one case, a corporate entity that, that, the, that the regional theater was protecting us from. And in the other case, it was sort of an old-fashioned production where you had a, a, lead, a couple lead producers, but a, a lot of other producers. And because of that, that you know, mass of people, they could all bother each other. You know, <laughs> they, couldn't, they, couldn't just, yeah, they couldn't just put the hammer down, you know, on us. I, our our uh, producer, I feel like I should say, Scott Sanders, who's the main producer. There are a bunch of producers. Quincy Jones is also involved. Quincy, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he really has protected this. I mean, he had a vision about how he wanted it to be. I think he had the you know great balls to bring in who he got to do it because there's many of us that haven't had experience before. Um, mixed and in with some people that have had... And to do it in the first place, because... And, yeah, yeah, and to do it in the first place. And he's just been really protective all the way through of seeing that it developed the way that everyone felt it should be developed. Was there um, any extra burden on you because it had been a book and had been a movie? There's always a burden when you have something that's that, not only successful, but revered, I think. So, you know, you do not want to be the one that takes the color purple down. So there's, <laughs> you know, there's, especially being the white one. But, um, uh, 
But on the other hand, you have such unbelievably fantastic source material to work with. We had um, full access to Alice Walker. Um, you, you know, we, we tend to follow the book a little more closely than the movie. And there were certain things, like in writing for the character of Mr. You don't really know about Mr. from either the book or the movie, because everything's from Seeley's perspective. So um, we were having a lot of tribal, trouble writing, um, you know, what is now seven Mr. songs ago, but, <laughs> you know, the first Mr. song. And, uh, you know, we would email Alice at, like, you know, four in the morning. You know, what does Mr. Dream about? <laughs> and we would get... You know, reams back. Uh, you know, we've got like the color purple five, six, seven, and eight. Mm -hmm. You know, from her. So I, I you know, I, I feel like that in our case, it was incredible to have that source material. But still, you're essentially making up your own story and your own um, sequence of events. Um, and I, I do want to say one thing because you were talking about having the two lyricists and. Um, I feel like with us, there were the three of us, Marsha, who, uh, you know, I, Marsha Norman is as spontaneous as it comes. Like, I always, you know, say to her, okay, like, you know, what is your take on this? And she just, like, spits out and spits out and spits out. So between Marsha Norman, Alice Walker, Steven Spielberg, the three of us, it was a lyricist heyday, you know, in terms of <laughs> yeah, just you get brilliant so much material. material. I find with, with um, um, Dr. Zhivago, it's, we don't have that source. I mean, and Pasternak, God, what, what would I would yeah, give yeah. to be able to talk to him? So we sort of pour through all of the, the biographical material and the criticism that's been written about it, and then ultimately you have to just go on your own instincts. Absolutely. But also, you know, you're doing The Color Purple, which is a you know, a, a, a great icon of literature, and I'm doing Dr. Zhivago, Marsha and I did The Secret Garden, which yeah, also yeah. had that. So you have to be very responsible to the underlying material and get the essence of it before you even begin to say, yes, I can do this. And that does take a while. I mean, you've been at yeah. this for six years. I've been at Zhivago for 10. I mean, it wow. just takes, takes a long time before you settle into not only what you can do artistically with it, but the, the business of it, you know, where, where you say, okay, we can raise the money for this, and there's a, a director, and I think the director is all important. And, the, uh, you know, if there's somebody that, that is a good leader that can take all of the pieces, and, uh, you know, I don't, think, I don't think we would be able to do Dr. Zhivago, we call it Zhivago, without Des Makinoff, who has just totally taken this, this in, as, as Jack O'Brien does in, at the Old Globe. They're only about 20 minutes apart. It's interesting that, that the country is a part of the world. great part of the world. Yeah. Very curious about the pop and the Pasternak, though. Pop? Well, you know what? Because I have the background of being a pop writer and knowing pop music, it isn't that I write a pop song, but I put that knowledge that I have of Russian music and of pop, and I make, us, make the song be singable and, and readable. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I don't think that you can write in the theater without saying, I've got an audience that has to connect to this music. It's our responsibility. It's, a, it's the silliest word in the wor world, uh, pop music. Yeah. It stands for popular. Right. What a, right. what a, oh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, oh. I, you know, when people say, I love when some of uh, my more high-flown uh, artistic friends say, ah, you know what, I'm going to sell out. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to write commercial. I said, oh, it's so hard yeah. to sell out. Well, the best sign you can put outside a Broadway theater is sold out. <laughs> no one says they betrayed everything. They're sold out. Oh, uh, um, pop music means that it's something that a lot of different people who don't belong to the same club can all Connect. appreciate, connect to, that it speaks to them. Uh, 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 and, and when I've written a pop song and I've gotten a gold record, uh, I think about, well, let's see, that's, um, this is a million people in Japan and Australia and the U.S. And, and somehow there's something in this. That's the most glorious thing in the world, that you could find something. And, and it isn't always that you bring it to the lowest common denominator. It's that you find a way to say something very directly or to say something that people haven't said before and someone hears it and says, oh yes, finally there's a song that, that says that thing that I've been thinking. So um, 
you know, a, 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 a good Broadway score, uh, I'm, I'm saying Broadway specifically with that commercial notion in mind, uh, would be great if all the music had the traits of popular mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say not the, the lowest common denominator, but the highest common de denominator. Yeah. And that's, that's what we try to do. Obviously, you're not going to do any work. We're not going to take on a project that will take anywhere between two and ten years to do if we don't feel we are, it's, it's a place that we can put our best work into, our heart and our soul and our, you know, it's a great commitment to, to write a a musical, whether it's... And the other thing is, you know, there's fantastic pop music and there's crappy pop right. music. And, uh, you know, I've always had the highest regard for pop music. And when people say there's this conflict between art and commerce, I have never seen that. The challenge is to get something that is as kind of down the middle enough so that people can feel they're a part of it, uh, which is the commercial part of it, and different enough and out there enough so that it pulls them in in a way they've never been pulled in before. Um, and if you can combine the art and the commerce in one form, you have a very large hit record, and, you know, and a, and a very popular show. So, I mean, to me, the challenge is mush those two together, not, oh, you need to be here or you need to be there. We've talked a lot today about um, writing directly for the theater original scores, but I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about this phenomenon of jukebox musicals uh, taking either uh, taking existing songs and fashioning a plot around them or just making something that's more like a review. And I'm curious if anyone here has any feelings about that and its relationship to... I have a lot of songs in one that's coming out next year year, which is, there's a Earth, Wind, and Fire musical called Hot Feet, and I have, um, I think, I have a September Boogie Wonderland in the stone and something else in that, but then also help them write the new songs for it. It's a 100% different um, experience in the color purple where we're actually writing the musical and the music in it, whereas this is very much you know, here are these 12 greatest hits, we're going to string them together, you know, what's missing, let's write songs now that push the story along a little bit. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> I, well, I actually had a fantastic time working on this, so I, you know, but it, but it is uh, very different and it's not as story driven as you know, the color purple is. So I'm, I'm not sure of its fate. I mean, I know I, w I would sit there and have an absolutely fantastic time watching this, and the choreography is fantastic. But I tend to look at the separate elements there and say, does this add up as an entertaining evening? Whereas my standards for what we're doing and what I know of, of the other work being, you know, discussed is, is a very different um, standard. Sure. My, my biggest problem with them, I guess, there, my, my difficulty is two odd things. One is, we've got a terrible dilemma, which is there are only so many Broadway houses. I mean, it isn't like the same thing as the internet or record albums or CDs, that is, rather than dating myself, where, you know, if you have 15 different kinds of artists, we'll put out 15 different CDs. Mm -hmm. We only have so many spaces that we can go in. And it seems sad to fill those spaces with evenings of music that everybody already knows and can hear uh, th when there are concert halls where that can be done too. And, and so that kind of saddens me because I want to hear new scores, I want to see musicals with books, and I, I think you can pull off a jukebox musical. It's been done sort of by a couple of people. I think it tends to gravitate towards being phony. You know what my other problem is? My other problem is that some, there are clever people who can contrive a book to a pre-existing score that can, of, of mainly hit songs. But it's kind of like when you go to wrestling nowadays, if you go to, uh, not that any of us do, but it used, to be, it used to be that you knew that wrestlers were fake, but you figured a lot of the people in the audience didn't, so it was kind of still fun because they, they weren't in on it, and you could sort of enjoy their enthusiasm. If you know all these songs, and we tell a story, and people keep bursting into this song, and you know it, then you're sort of, you know it's not real. But isn't that it's, sort of what we talked about before, about uh, how great it was in the old days, 
when people would either go into the theater humming songs. No, it's, but it's, it's different. That's it's, a very it, different it, thing. It's different, and it's, it's very interesting because when I think of what a pop song is, um, and I've never, I've never written one. I mean, I wish <laughs> God I had because I have the greatest, I mean, it's more than respect. It's just like love for a pop song. It's a jewel. It's like a, it's a, it's a small jewel, but it's also gigantic. But it's, it's a three-minute, it's a, it's a very American thing, too. It's a jewel. It, 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 it gets inside you. And, uh, um, and it's, there's a sound to it, you know, because it's, it's off a record. Um, and uh, it just becomes a part of your life. And it becomes a part of your life in a very, very strong way, in a way that maybe a, 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 a long novel, a long form piece of art can't, in a way that maybe a great painting can. It's, uh, it's this nugget. And um, now, that's, that's why I love a great pop song. Uh, when they asked me to do Fomanti, and someone said, well, would you consider um, uh, using some of the songs from the movie, I, you know, I just smiled and I said, I will do that when bats fly out of my ass. <laughs> because, because there were some great so songs in that movie. And, you know, A, it, this is my two and a half hours. I would like to be given a chance to write a few songs myself. And B, that I'm not going up against a song everybody in my generation has heard 500, 1,000 times. <laughs> There's no way. It's not fair. Because everyone's going to say, Oh, well, you know, that song, that song, that proves that those songs are great for a reason. And that guy, Yazbek, this new guy, he just can't write songs like that, you know? It's like, you just, there's no, there's no way you're going to win. Yeah, I, I turned down a project for the exact same reason. Someone wanted me to write book and score of, uh, for a, a movie, and they said, go to town with it. But we do want to use that one tune in the movie that every and I thought, then I can't, I can't win. Right. Because everyone's going to say, yeah, it's still the best song in the show, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. still win. Just, okay, just I, when I hear it, it rings a bell. Of course and it rings a bell. And they'll say it because they know it, it's in their blood. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's they, like Lara's theme, they, I didn't use that. Which they, is they, yeah, exactly. I'm good sure move. you've been... Yeah. Good move. <laughs> but we, we get asked constantly, is sister in there? Yeah. You know. Boy. No. <laughs> it's a different. It's a different medium. It's right. a different the, entity. The difference uh, in what you cited is that if you know on the street where you live before you go to see the show, you know that it's from a musical, and then you go to see the musical and you right. say, "Oh, now I know why he was so happy. Mm -hmm. Now I know mm -hmm. why he. Now I know why Tony and Maria are so in love." Whereas it's the inverse of that. You don't think that would have happened. You say, "Oh." The, be the best you'll say is, oh, that was a clever way to get to that song, mm -hmm. right. and which it's, is and not what a musical it, you know is what, about. And it reminds, me of, it reminds me of when I was, um, I made the mistake of um, seeing a comedian that I just idolized for, for years uh, when he was at his absolute peak, Steve Martin, and I went and saw him at like, Madison Square Garden, and he came out and he would just say, excuse me, and everyone would just go crazy, and you couldn't hear anything he was saying. He would just wait for, like, <laughs> excuse me, or, you know, like the right. five catchphrases. <laughs> and I, I feel like when I sit there, and it's, it's true not only of jukebox musicals, but sometimes of musicals that are very, very directly taken from um, another source, usually a movie, that's another conversation, when people are just sitting there going, here it comes, here comes that part, and then it comes, and you're thinking... You just paid a hundred bucks so that you could sort of see this again. <laughs> <laughs> well, but there is something to that, which people want something familiar and, yeah. and to feel like they're going to know yes. that in advance they're going to like it. It's a damn shame, though. I mean, it's 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 fine, you know. I'm I'm, if there are producers out there smart enough to to really make money off of jukebox mu box musicals, um, okay, it's a, it's a shame, you know. But it's really a shame that that uh, it's really a shame that audiences and I, I feel like a complete ass saying this, but it's a shame that audiences can't be a little better educated. And when I say that, I don't mean not listen to, to pop music and rock music, but just come in, in the way that certain audiences do in certain parts of Europe, come expecting more than just that, just familiarity or just pure, um, oh, I, okay, well, this was, I didn't fall asleep, so this was worth $100. <laughs> you know, come <laughs> expecting something that might change you. And then that will keep us honest, and there will be a back and forth, and the whole thing will come up if we do that. You want to on this? I didn't. Well, I just wanted to know what the story in Monty was behind Hot Stuff. I thought, <laughs> you know, it could have been <laughs> new insight into what that song's about. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I didn't use the song. 
No, I know. I, I, I thought it was we've all missed out on something. <laughs> But when you, when you think about projects that you want to work on, do you think about, is this going to be commercial? Is this going to be something that, you know, will attract producers? Well, I mean, how do you, what draws you to the material? I mean, obviously, Color Purple was something that was, as you said. I, I get very you. nervous if, if I start, if my first thought is, this could really be successful. Uh, I like to think that when we're working on it and think this, I like to think, gee, people could really enjoy this. But if I start to think, hey, that may, if it starts to make a lot of sense and I feel like suddenly I'm viewing it from an accounting point of view, uh, I'm saying, oh, yes, because that demographic and as long as we throw in this person, then it, it's just a scary way to create something that's going to take. And it, you said it so aptly, which is, you know, another thing about being a pop songwriter as opposed to what we're doing is, Whenever I started to write a pop song, I was theoretically maybe only three minutes away from being done. <laughs> I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I, I wrote Escape, the Pina Colada song, in an hour and a half. A lot of people think I should have taken two hours. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but... You would have ruined it, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but, but seriously, the, the song that unfortunately is my best-known song, single song it was, took me an evening to write the lyric. And, uh, and when we get involved in these projects, we're saying goodbye to years of our lives. Uh, even you with your, you know, you, you've been uh, one of the most accelerated successes that there is. But I mean, Drood took me three years. And, uh, and, and other shows, I'm at Marty, I've been working on since 98. Say Goodnight Gracie uh, about George Burns, not a musical, but that was four years of having, took me one year just to be able to write, I, thought, I felt like George Burns, to speak for him uh, dramatically. Um, do, you think, do you think that keeps more pop songwriters from writing for the theater because it takes so long to get it on? Well, I think they, I, I, I think it all, it, the grass is always green. Every, I, I've, I, I've, I've written two novels for Random House, I've written TV series. Every time I got into the field, I thought, oh, now I'm in the good one. And then you learn what there is to do in it. I think there are people, I think it, writing a musical is like when people say to you in, at a cocktail party, I got a great idea for a movie. And, you know, everyone, in the con everyone that you've ever met has a great idea for a movie. Uh, why don't they do that? Or they'll see something where there's a, 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 a fire and uh, in, a, in, a, in a, I don't know, just, they'll say, oh, say, oh I had that idea years ago. But it's, it's not <laughs> just that. It's, you don't just sit down and have the idea. So I think some pop songwriters think, I've got to get into that field like you did. And you say, yeah, okay, but be prepared to work endless frustrating hours and possibly to commit to create something that took years to create and it just never gets heard uh, or doesn't get heard for the longest time. I think it's daunting. It is daunting, but I tell you, I, th I think th to answer your question about when you're creating something, decide to do a project. Is it a commercial thing or is, it, um, is, is there something else? I think we have to think of both. I think if you're going to commit yourself to something that can take anywhere between two and 10 and 12, My Fair Lady, took 12 years to get on. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that you feel there will be, it will continue to live after I've finished. I mean, the real frustrating thing is, and I've written many of them, and I'm sure we all have, of things that are wonderful and don't have a life now because it's, they're on the shelf, they didn't get done. Um, <coughs> so I think that we think of, of both things, I think. We have to love doing it because we're putting so much time into it, but we have to feel that there is a, a commercial viability. And the title is often very important, you know? <laughs> I, the color purple, you're calling it that. You're not calling it shug. You're not calling it something else. You're, you're going by the, you know, the, yeah. the title that everybody wants to go with. Um, so I, I think it is a very important thing to think both ways. I was also curious to ask you, um, you and Ali and Brenda are some of the very few female uh, composers and on working on Broadway right now. Do you feel that there is some issue about, you know, all boys club that happens on it Broadway? It sure was. When, yeah. when we did The Secret Garden, it was very hard to, to, to get in there. I don't think so much anymore, although at the time that I, that we went, um, we got to Broadway with The, the Secret Garden, I was the fourth female composer that ever got to Broadway. And I think, you know, that, that really is an, an, an all-boys club and the perception that men have a more, uh, are, are stronger, are, you know, Or they gutsier. do the music and the girls right, do the, the lyrics. Right, the girls do the lyrics, right. <laughs> but none of that with your team. 
No. <laughs> He's uh, two, two of the gals, so, <laughs> you know. No, I don't know. But I actually um, wasn't really even aware of that. I know in pop music, like, a, to have a female producer was unheard of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, when in fact... In order to get your songs heard, you've got to do a demo, which is, you know, cutting a record. So, it, I mean, that was just, that was always crazy. And I wasn't really aware of theater until I started writing it. And I'm going through all these shows, and it's like, where are the girls? You know, it's certainly not that they're not talented enough. So there must be some of the old boys club. Well, you're working with uh, Marilyn Bergman right now, and uh, she's certainly one of the... the Longest established lyricist in that category, but there aren't really a lot of examples of. No, no, it's uh, it's uh, it's absurd, especially when you realize how um, important um, the female audience is to Broadway and to well, to theater. Um, uh, on a Saturday night, uh, it's the women have dragged these men to the theater. The, the, you know that on a Saturday evening, those guys are sitting there, a lot of lasagna. <laughs> uh, and uh, and they're there. You you know you have to win them over because they, they aren't there voluntarily. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's still no. I mean we're not even close. But it's been amazing that present company has been able to do what they've been able to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, on your shows, I mean I think people look at Full Monty and Dirty Run schedule to sort of shows that guys can really sink their teeth into, I and mean, they're both sort of guy shows. That well, Full Monty had a, had a problem, uh, with marketing-wise. And the problem was, it, it, it is a guy show. It's about guys. Right. I mean, every main character is a guy, except for one. And yet, because they take their clothes off at the end, a lot of guys were like, I'm not going to go see that. Okay. So it was like a... <laughs> I mean, it was really, it was hard to market out, out of that, and, it, w and they, it never successfully was marketed r the right way in, in this city. When the tour figured it out, um, with this show, Scoundrels, it's, I mean, I guess it's, I don't know. I mean, well, it, actually, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but the, w the woman in the play. Yeah, plays she's the one. She's, she's, she's got the cojones by the end. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think because... Uh, I think because some of my songs are, especially in Monty, are a little angry, you know, and you don't seem that much ang like real sort of anger, you know, <laughs> in, the, in a musical theater. Maybe you got that, you, you know, a little of that. But, uh, I'll, you know, if it's a good story and I want to do it, I'll do it if it's all, if it's an all women's story. Right. Um, I, I just remember the story that uh, Cy Fewer told me. And uh, he said, um, he said, Frank Lesser, I was eating lunch with Frank Lesser, and he just said, Cy, no more mug musicals. <laughs> and, and, and he said, what? And he goes, no more mug musicals. No more musicals for mugs. You know, like he got, that was his thing for he, a he while. He did his Guys and Dolls thing. Mm -hmm. and then, yeah, 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 no more mug musicals. Yeah, that's right. uh, we just have a few minutes left, but I want to ask, uh, I guess we'll start with Stephen. Now that you have the theater bug, can you see yourself on a new career in the musical theater? Is this something that you want to do more regularly? Well, you've given me the idea to now go ahead with the hip-hop musical stuff. So. Oh, good. <laughs> I think, yeah, no, well, I think everybody, we've all agreed that at, coming from pop, it's just such a liberating and, you know, limitless field to be in in terms of where you can go musically, tempos, shifting time signatures. It's, it's just so much fun to play in this world. And, and uh, to, the idea of, although I, I'm curious what will happen when I try to write a four-minute song again, but no, I would love to do it again. Well, the songs that you wrote from Madonna, for example, like Papa Don't Preach, were in fact like little... Well, that one is. I, I didn't actually write that one. Oh, sorry. Produced that one. I, I did. <laughs> oh, produced it. I sorry. produced that one. But yeah, no, that one was very much a story. And, uh, but it's, it, it'll be fun to see what that's like again. But this is, nothing can be like this. It's great. And uh, uh, David, are we seeing the next movie adaptation from you, or are you seeing original coming up? Uh, there's a, there's a, the, the latest in a series of directors who've been trying to talk me into doing a, uh, what amounts to a jukebox musical, except that no one's ever heard my stuff. I mean, mm. my, <laughs> albums, my albums are like, my albums are like dozen selling albums. <laughs> so, 
if you could get, if the, if the, whoever sends out the gold records, if they could send out just like one made of concrete, that's fine. <laughs> but uh, but every, every year or, or so, someone says, God, I love these songs. Let's there do something. Oh, there it is. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a compilation. Of they say, let's do something. And I, and I say, okay, what do you want to do? And then I, then I get discouraged. But that's one thing. I'm discussing it with someone, and I'm, I think he's pretty smart, and he seems to be doing something good. And Jeffrey Lane and I are, uh, who wrote the book to, to uh, Scoundrels, and who I had a great collaboration with, we, we have some ideas um, that, were, that were knocking around. But there's nothing kind of like that's going to be here Imminently. soon on Broadway. And we already have one, another... Sh uh, Ali Willis show to look forward to with uh, I Huff hope Feet. so. I mean, I, I have absolutely loved doing this. The you know the the freedom of the writing, and then for me, <clears throat> who does a lot of other stuff besides music, it just seems like the perfect musical to put everything into. You know, because it's you know visual, because it's uh, technology involved because it's you know live people and interactivity between the audience it just seems like the perfect medium well we have a lot to look forward to but unfortunately we have to stop here um, i need to tell you that the american theater wings working in the theater seminars are brought to you from the graduate center of the city university of new york in association with cuny's uh, department of continuing education and public programs as well as the longtime partnership at cuny tv on behalf of the wing and the new york uh, musical theater uh, festival I'd like to thank all of our panel and thank all of you for watching.